born into poverty over 2,030 years ago in an insignificant village. Married off at a young age. This illiterate, backwoods girl would soon be thrust onto the world stage. This is the life of Miriam, the Virgin Mother. I'd like to take you back to circa 16 BCE, to a small Galilean village named Nazareth, located not along any busy road, but out in the boonies. It's approximately 18 miles from the Sea of Galilee, 23 miles from Samaria, 76 miles from the traditional site of Yeshua's eventual baptism along the Jordan River some 85 miles from the Mount of Olives and the Temple, and over 1,800 miles from the city of Rome. This photo, courtesy of the New York Post, shows its excavation in 2009. According to the Seattle Times of that year, within its some four acres were just over four dozen tiny homes. They were made of wood and stone, and they housed mostly, if not entirely, poor families. This tight-knit community must have done whatever they had had to do to make ends meet, while at the same time bending over backwards to observe as many of the instructions of the Torah's lawyers as possible. To quote from theologian Scott Korb's book, Life in Year One, What the World Was Like in First Century Palestine, Truth be told, when Nathaniel of Cana took a swipe at Jesus and his hometown in John's Gospel, saying, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was only saying what everyone else around him was already thinking. Back then, Nazareth was a nothing town, of which there's almost nothing left. Whatever roads existed in Nazareth were unpaved, and there were no public buildings in town, just as there were no public inscriptions. Another indication that almost no one there could read. Houses were built of stones and mud, gathered from fields and then topped with thatched reeds. Everything would have been one story. Your neighbor might have lived in a cave. The very few signs of life that archaeologists have been able to find from the first century include underground cisterns for water, some storage bins, stones for grinding grains into flour, vats to ferment and store wine, and pieces of locally made measuring cups and some other stone vessels. The fewer than 400 residents of Nazareth owned nothing of any value to anyone else and appear to have imported absolutely nothing from other parts of the world. Again, he writes, it's likely that the average Nazarene or poor fisherman from Capernaum, uh, population 600 to 1500, a few miles away, would never even have met a Roman. It is among these poor families that one girl, given the common name Miriam, is born. Of her family, all that can be known biblically is that, according to John 19.25, she has a sister or half-sister also named Miriam. Now, this was not an unusual naming practice at the time, and was common among the Romans as well. She also has a much older relative named Elisheba. Now, unlike many statues and other depictions of her you might have seen, she's actually probably no taller than five feet, scrawny, perhaps a bit underfed. Her hair is very long and either dark brown or black, and her eyes a shade of brown. The typical Jewish girl of her time would not 
have received a formal education and probably would have been mostly, if not entirely, illiterate. Her mother and the other Jewish women with whom she regularly interacted would have been her primary teachers and would have taught her how to cook, care for children, assist in taking care of crops, etc. She would have learned the stories and sung the songs commonly told and sung among Jewesses. Her understanding of Torah would have come not from listening at the foot of a rabbi, but from attending synagogue, observing society around her, and perhaps from gleaning scraps of information from whatever she might hear her father or any brother say while talking with other males. Remembering that this was not a century ago, nor ten centuries ago, but two thousand years ago, sometimes we forget how distant into the past this was. We must remember as we delve into her childhood that it will likely be a bit disturbing. And indeed, it is. According to a number of sources, including Avraham Steinberg's Encyclopedia of Jewish Medical Ethics, a compilation of Jewish medical law on all topics of medical interests, Terza Meacham's Legal Religious Status of the Virgin, published in the Shalvi Hyman Encyclopedia of Jewish Women, Pieter W. van der Horst's article, Sex, Birth, Purity, and Asceticism in the Proto-Evangelium Jacobi, in the journal Neo Testamentica, as well as Michael L. Statlow's Jewish Marriage in Antiquity. Here is what we know. As soon as a Jewess of this period turned 12 years old and one day and could produce two lower hairs, she would be considered marriageable and was betrothed as quickly as possible to an interested man chosen by her father or in lieu of a father her brothers or family patriarch. The man would pay her family an agreed upon bride price, which the super patriarchal community would consider one of the few redeeming aspects of having a daughter. A daily Jewish prayer then and now goes, thank you for not making me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Note that it was said in this order, because the Jews of the day would list people in order of importance. To be a woman was worse in the Jewish mind than being a Gentile male or even a Jewish male slave. For this reason, the poorer the family, the sooner they would seek to give away their daughters in marriage. She would become her husband or master's property. The love attributed to Jacob for Rachel in Genesis 29-20 is celebrated precisely because it is unusual to encounter it in the biblical text, apart from the Song of Songs, of course. Unless we accept much, much later pseudepigraphal writings like the infancy Gospel of James, we have zero historical, biblical reason to presume that Miriam's upbringing is any different. So when we first meet her in Matthew 1, she is in all likelihood an illiterate girl not much older than 12, who has been raised not only in poverty, but also with the mindset that she is inherently worth less than even the poorest man in her village. Doubtless, she has heard her father pray that prayer every day. By the way, among Jews to this day, the female rejoinder to the prayer is, Thank you for making me according to your will. She is one of the lowest of the low, in one of the least significant Jewish villages. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Reads John 146. She has recently been given in exchange for a bride price to a craftsman of unknown age named Yosef but has yet to move into his house or consummate the legal union. Since marriages in which the husband was much older than the bride were far from unusual at the time, under a variety of circumstances, there is no way of knowing for certain how old he was. 
But it should be noted that boys became marriageable as soon as they turned 13 years and one day and could produce two hairs. According to The Two Shall Become One, Paul's bridal image as the source of his body language about the church, an article written by Michael Tate, <laughs> no, not him, in the journal Scripture Bulletin, betrothal for first century Jews lasted one year, and we don't know how far along into that period Miriam and Yosef were. Whether Yosef is taking Miriam as a secondary wife in accordance with the concurrent practice of polygamy, very unlikely, it should be said, given that Nazareth is a poor town and he is later implied to be poor himself as a first wife, or whether he is a widower, we cannot know from scripture. Yosef is in all likelihood himself from the same village, and being from the same village, the same small village, he is plausibly a cousin or some other relative. Again, unless you go by the Roman fan fiction, The Infancy Gospel of James, written around 150 years later. Nobody has the least expectation of what will soon happen. It's just another day in a poor, remote village. Miriam and Yosef aren't thinking, Wow, this is amazing! We're living in Matthew 1 right now! As far as their ideas for the future are concerned, they will wed, bear and raise children in their little community, hopefully live to see their grandchildren, and then lie down to join their forefathers. Who knows? Maybe Messiah will even appear before they close their eyes one last time. Personally, I find it remarkable that God seemed to choose a 12 and perhaps 13 year old to bring his son into the world. First century Jewish peasants must have been a lot more mature than most modern Western 20-year-olds. Furthermore, if I may digress just a bit to take a moment to talk about a hot topic of debate these dark days, it has become common to doubt that, at this point, Miriam is, in fact, still a virgin. Oh, Parthenos doesn't mean virgin, someone will say. It just means young girl. Well... It is true that the English term virgin does not convey exactly the same idea as Parthenos. No single English equivalent in fact exists. From a first century Greco-Roman perspective, a female became a Parthenos upon menarche, uh, the onset of her periods. She was reclassified as a Guinea after she became a wife during her early or mid-teens. As a result of social pressures and expectations, a respectable Parthenos was not to engage in sexual intimacy with a male until her wedding. Parthenos thus had the intended meaning of someone who is both a female virgin and an unmarried female of reproductive age, except for a few occasions in reference to pagan temple priestesses who only had sexual relations with pagan deities. The term is never used in concurrent literature to refer to only an unmarried female of reproductive age although at least once it is used to refer to a 20-year-old woman who was still a virgin. For more on this, see Anne Hellis Hansen's The Hippocratic Parthenos in Sickness and Health in Virginity Revisited, edited by Judith Fletcher and Bonnie McLaughlin, as well as Barbara E. Goff's Citizen Bacchae, Women's Ritual Practice in Ancient Greece. As it happened, the concept of a Parthenos was the same among both Romans and Jews, notwithstanding the matter of the Romans' application of the term to temple priestesses. There are still others who claim that Yeshua's conception by the Holy Spirit was an early Christian concoction to make it more appealing to Gentiles among whose religious stories the sexual impregnation of maidens by deities like Jupiter or the Zeus was commonplace. Think of Hercules, for example. Were Yeshua's conception by the Holy Spirit found only in Luke, which is ostensibly addressed to such a Gentile, then the argument might carry weight. But the fact is, quite independently of Luke, the conception is explicitly referenced in Matthew, a gospel account written by a devout Jew for other devout Jews, 
with the singular goal of demonstrating that Yeshua is the long-awaited Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. It would have been obscenely counterproductive to include a Gentile-appeasing, Jew-offending myth in such an account. Yet, here it is in Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, if one wants to behold a real, gentilized telling of Yeshua's conception and birth, then he or she should read the already mentioned Infancy Gospel of James, also called the Proto-Evangelium of James. <laughs> so much for that argument. The Holy Spirit, in whose power Romans 8.11 says Yeshua was impossibly physically resurrected immortal after undergoing days of real biological decay, also impossibly conceived Yeshua within the womb of a virgin. Surely to believe that the Spirit brought to physical life, let alone immortal physical life, a decaying corpse requires more faith than to believe that the same Spirit brought forth new physical life from a living womb. Conceived by the Spirit, resurrected by the Spirit. Returning to her story, it is now that she is visited by the angel Gabriel. He twice calls her favored by God and invites her to step into the role of the mother of the eternal king of the Jews. She accepts, calling herself the Lord's servant girl. Here at the dawn of the new era, we the readers are invited by Luke to remember the dawn of the previous one when another supernatural being made another offer to another girl named Hava, Eve. And she too accepted to the doom of creation. We are being invited to see this Miriam as a new Hava. Note the foreshadowing in Genesis 3.20 which says, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. This new Hava will indeed become the mother of all that live, in that she will give birth to him who is life. Luke's choice of words for the means by which the Lord is incarnated is worthy of note. When he writes, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, he uses a word that he uses only one other time in Luke Acts in reference to the Holy Spirit. Epirkomai the other being Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Luke is thus also inviting us to consider the Holy Spirit's acts in both the Incarnation and Pentecost in the same light. Following this visit, the 12-year-old girl ventures, possibly alone, to see her much older relative Elisheva who is at this point about six months further along in a miraculous pregnancy of her own, though by means of her husband, Zechariah, with the prophet Yochanan Hamatpil, John the Baptist. It is interesting that she seems to refrain from telling Yosef about the angel before traveling to a faraway, older female relative. Upon meeting, Leshba is immediately filled with the Holy Spirit herself, along with her unborn son, and she exclaims to Miriam through the Spirit, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Little Miriam then breaks into a song, likely one she'd composed and sung to herself during her roughly 80-mile trek to Hebron. And one it would seem she continued to sing to herself throughout her life, or at least remembered well enough to teach when the investigator Luke apparently interviewed her while writing his gospel account. Her song went as follows. 
My soul declares the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, he has put down the mighty from their thrones, and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. At this point, we ought to take a step back and remember that Miriam's situation is, from our future perspective, a fulfillment of a certain aspect of Jewish history. We who are already in the know understand Yeshua, Jesus, to be the fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets from passages such as Matthew 5.17. He is the manna from heaven, according to John 6.58. And as much of the epistle to the Hebrews attests, he is the perfect priest. Now, earlier in the biblical narrative, these concepts and items and roles are symbolically found together in one place, encased in pure gold, the Ark of the Covenant. It carried within it Aaron's rod, symbolizing the priesthood, the Ten Commandments, representing the law, and a sample of manna, the role being played by this illiterate, backwoods girl is then its fulfillment. Within her womb dwells the law and the prophets, the manna from heaven, the perfect priest. After a four-month stay, she makes the return journey back to Nazareth, only for Yosef to see with horror that she's around four months pregnant by, he naturally presumes, another man. Let's put that into perspective, shall we? Miriam is 12, maybe 13. She is four months pregnant, and her hormones are those of a pregnant teenage girl. She has just completed an 80-mile return trip from a place of rest and comfort with distant family. Let's hope she rode back in a wagon this time, or else she is exhausted. Very, very exhausted. There, back in Nazareth, Yosef sees that she is pregnant. Now, Yosef, being an ancient Middle Eastern man, does not know that there are eight planets in the solar system. He does not know that the Earth revolves around the Sun. He does not know that the Americas exist or what germs are. But there are three things he does know. One, Miriam is pregnant. Two, it takes a man to get a woman pregnant. And three, he is not the man who got Miriam pregnant. And so, he rejects her. While this might seem traumatic enough for the girl from a modern Western view, this is not the modern West. Nazareth is a pious village and follows the Torah, including its punishments. And the Torah has rules for this kind of situation. In the morning, Miriam knows. One of two things will happen when the village finds out. Either she will be ridiculed for having been a stupid young girl who foolishly traveled alone and got raped along the way by a stranger in the wilderness, or she will be dead by tomorrow night for adultery. Let's look at the second scenario first. Deuteronomy 22, 20-21 reads, If, however, this charge is true, that evidence of the young woman's virginity was not found, then they shall bring the young woman out to the entrance of her father's house, and the men of her town shall stone her to death, because she committed a disgraceful act in Israel by prostituting herself in her father's house. And Deuteronomy 22, 23-24 says, If there is a young woman, a virgin, already engaged to be married, and a man meets her in the town and lies with her, 
You shall bring both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she did not cry for help in the town, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. Now, let's look at the other scenario. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27 reads, But if the man meets the engaged woman in the open country, and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. You shall do nothing to the young woman. The young woman has not committed an offense punishable by death, because this case is like that of someone who attacks and murders a neighbor. Since he found her in the open country, the engaged woman may have cried for help, but there was no one to rescue her. But no matter what happens tomorrow, the girl is confident of this. She has lost Yosef. The angel's words of promise, Yosef's rejection, tomorrow's likely trial. <sighs> she is confused and upset and probably spends the night praying and crying. Unbeknownst to her, Yosef, for his part, goes to sleep that night hurt, but with no intention of doing anything the next day to hurt her. Matthew 1.19 says that Yosef, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. As he sleeps, an angel intervenes in this horrible situation by appearing to him and saying, Yosef, Yosef, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. The next morning, Yosef and Miriam meet. He looks into her sleepless, bloodshot eyes and tells her that they will face the future together. He knows full well that from then on people will assume, naturally, that he must be the father. And he accepts it. It is very possible, probable, that this shared crisis becomes the bedrock for true emotional attachment and deep trust between the two of them. You know what happens next. About the national census and about the approximately 91 mile trek to Bethlehem. Given that she gives birth along the way, one can only imagine how awful it must have been to travel that far late in one's pregnancy on the back of a donkey, no less. And you know about the inconveniently timed birth that had to take place in the lowliest of environments, among donkeys, certainly, and other farm animals, perhaps. Incidentally, Old Testament scholar Michael S. Heiser promotes an interesting theory by the late Ernest L. Martin dating the Lord's birth to September 11, 3 BCE. It's worth checking out. Here's a link. Just eight days later, Miriam is back on her feet, dutifully taking newborn Yeshua with Yosef to the temple, located a little over six miles away, to present him there and have him circumcised. Now, either on the back of a donkey or on foot, the six-mile journey could not have been easy for a girl who had just given birth the week before. They present for sacrifice to young turtle doves or pigeons, in accordance with what the law stipulated for impoverished worshippers. So there they are, tired, 13-year-old Miriam, new mother still sore and still adjusting to the baby's cries and demands, and Yosef, possibly a new father himself. Baby Yeshua has just been circumcised and is still screaming bloody murder. And to top it all off, they are broke. And it's at this moment that they are approached by two other pious Jews who both talk to them over the baby's cries. The first is an old man named Simeon who blesses them and prophetically warns Miriam, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. An elderly woman named Anna then appears and begins to direct visitors and worshippers to the screaming infant, declaring him to be the redemption of Israel. What a day 
Following this, the family returns to Nazareth, where Miriam finally moves into Yosef's house, and they at least appear to consummate the marriage. Does Yosef have children by her after this? Biblically, it is impossible to ascertain. Though we are certainly told much later that Yeshua has both brothers and sisters, it is a frustrating fact that half-siblings in this part of the world and at this time are commonly referred to as brothers and sisters. Both sides of this debate have a lot of emotional investments in the question that can get in the way too. Not that it matters, but I have no problem with Yosef having children by Miriam. But on the other hand, I dislike the idea of any parents favoring one child over another. In any case, there seems to be more to the mystery than whether the word until in Matthew 1.25 should be read in the same sense as in Matthew 28.20. At some point between now and a couple years later, a group of Eastern astrologers track the family down and give them awfully expensive gifts. Gold, incense, and myrrh. Shortly hereafter, of course, Yosef, Miriam, and the child make a hasty getaway into Egypt to escape the wrath of the puppet king, Hordos, who is under the impression that someone has been born who will, if not killed as soon as possible, cast him and his family down from their place of power. It's not implausible that the family pawns the astrologer's gifts to start a new life in the land of the pyramids and the Great Sphinx. Incidentally, had the astrologers arrived at the same time as the shepherds, as is commonly depicted, then Yosef and Miriam would have been compelled to pawn one or all of the gifts at the temple for more appropriate sacrifices than turtle doves. After the death of Hordos, Yosef packs up shop and takes the family back to Nazareth. Scripture is frustratingly silent for the next 30 or so years, giving us only an extended glimpse of a scene when Yeshua, now 12, is one year shy of becoming a man. If nothing else, it clues us into the fact that no, neither Miriam nor Yosef fully understands who Yeshua is and what he is supposed to do. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? The boy says. Miriam, who is now in her mid-twenties, is afterward left contemplating, deciding not to speak up about it, but to keep everything in her heart. It would appear from his subsequent disappearance from scripture that Yosef dies, and Miriam becomes a widow before Yeshua's public ministry begins. This needs to be remembered when we come to that instance wherein she and Yeshua's brothers appear outside a home where he's preaching, pleading with him to come back home with them because they think he's gone mad. Miriam's inclusion in these passages should not necessarily be interpreted as implying that she agrees with his half or stepbrothers. A woman's word is worth so little at this point, and in this place in history, that any sons of hers or of Yosef's would not believe the story of Yeshua's conception and the prophecy of his role if it comes from Miriam alone. If Yosef died before telling them, then she has indeed likely never made any explicit attempt to tell them herself. After all, were those sons to hear her tell such a wild story, they would be obligated to submit her to the local Jewish authorities for blasphemy, or at least madness. Incidentally, his brother's apparent ignorance of his supernatural origin strongly lends itself to the idea that they were in fact conceived after he was born. So anyway, her presence with the men in this passage does not necessarily indicate that she agrees with them, but only that she is submitting to them, for they are effectively the male heads of her family. Furthermore, this event is likely taking place outside of the family's hometown of Nazareth. Miriam would likely be socially and culturally inclined to say nothing about anything to anyone. Had she not left Nazareth with the men of her family but remained home at this tense time, her inaction might have been perceived as a scandalous display of soft familial insubordination. But backing up a bit to the first of the seven miracles recorded in the fourth gospel account, we are reminded once again that though Miriam now seems to understand more than she did years earlier, 
she still does not understand fully. At a wedding banquet, she uses her parental authority over Yeshua to compel him to perform a miracle. He reluctantly obliges, but chastises her for failing to understand. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. She next appears in the biblical narrative at the foot of the cross, now in her mid-forties, bewailing her dying son who is somewhere in his thirties. Watching and wailing with her are her sister, Miriam, Salome, Miriam Magdala, and Yeshua's best friend. For reasons we might easily deduce, she and Yeshua appear to have at last been disowned by the other men of her family because her sons or stepsons Yaakov, Yehuda, and Shimon are nowhere to be seen. Unless one of the women listed is her daughter or stepdaughter, none of her daughters are with her either. And so one of Yeshua's final acts before he suffers a heart attack and dies is to see to it that she is taken care of by someone he can trust, commending her into the care of his best friend, with whom she seems to live the rest of her years. Of the traumatic toll the whole episode takes on her, it is worth noting that she is not counted among those women who later set out to anoint Yeshua's rotting corpse with spices. After his resurrection and ascension to the throne, we encounter a radically changed family scenario for Miriam. She and Yeshua's brothers, reunited in Yeshua's name, and praying and worshiping alongside each other with the apostles and the others when the Holy Spirit formally descends upon God's people, invigorating and emboldening them and speaking through them in a multitude of languages about the powerful things God had done. Incidentally, 1 Corinthians 15.7 would seem to suggest that soon after his resurrection, Yeshua had appeared uniquely and personally to his half or stepbrother Yaakov. This is Miriam's final appearance in the biblical narrative. Nothing but later traditions tell us anything more about this dear woman who through obedience to God and humility before us, enduring poverty, scandal, familial rejection, and utter heartbreak and horror, lived the life that we now know as the life of the Virgin Mary. You might ask, why did God choose Miriam? Why? It's impossible to know exactly, but one of her most outstanding characteristics is just how lowly she had been. She had been a young girl from a poor and ill-reputed hamlet, and the first time she gave birth, it was in a room for animals. As she herself sung with glee, God regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. Just as with Gideon and just as with David, God glorified himself by accomplishing his will through the weak and in 